This week, I'm joined by John Strand. We're going to interview Mike Nichols. He's the vice president of product management at Endgame. We're going to talk about MITRE's evaluation of a few different products, Endgame's included, as well as the introduction of an open source query language called EQL or Event Query Language. Then in the enterprise news, all kinds of news stories from Ixia uh, and ProtectWise have a partnership, Ping Identity. Fortinet is announcing some uh, new automation with AWS. Yubico has a really interesting integration with a technology that I didn't know about before called AWS IoT Greengrass. So stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Improve the efficiency and effectiveness of your security operations with DF Lab Security Orchestration, Automation, and Response Technology. Automate threat containment, orchestrate incident response, and measure operational performance with DF Lab's Inc. Mansour platform. Leverage your current security resources to minimize incident resolution time, maximize analyst efficiency, increase the number of incidents handled, and reduce overall risk. Inc. Mansour acts as a force multiplier, enabling your security team to do more with less. Streamline the full incident response life cycle automation process today. Keep your cybersecurity incidents under control with DF Labs. Visit dflabs.com forward slash security weekly and request to see Inc. Mansour live in action. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Welcome to episode 118 of Enterprise Security Weekly for December 5th, 2018. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. I am joined remotely by Mr. John Strand. John, welcome. Got to hit that mute button properly. Hey, good to be back. I think this is three for three, three weeks Dude, in a row. It's That's awesome. great. It's and, awesome. And uh, Christmas just cannot get here fast enough. Yes, very happy to have you on this episode super excited about all the content uh super excited about infosec world next year as well uh which is great conference john i don't think you've been yet but it is really cool it's an excuse to go to disney world uh it's held april 1st through the 3rd at disney's contemporary resort um and again it's a great conference technical folks uh business folks kind of coming together there's a discount code os19 sec week that gets you 15 percent off the main conference or a world pass so we'll That'll jump very right. Cool. Yeah, it is, year, it's they, cool. They have a really stacked speaker lineup. They they have, it just looks like a really cool conference. And hopefully not next year, but the year after, mm -hmm. I will be able to go. Yes, that'd be awesome, dude. Yeah, we should do like a whole segment on conferences uh, on this show. We should actually. Um, so I want to introduce, uh, well, no stranger to the show, of course, Mike Nichols, uh, the VP of Product for Endgame. Mike, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Yes, nice to have you here today. How are things in endpoint security land? I like to just term it as endpoint security, right? Because we all, you know, protection, detection, re response, all that stuff. I call it endpoint security at a high level. Boy, it's been busy. I'm sure you've seen the news of uh, people in our space uh, going through acquisitions, going through influxes of capital. Lots of lots of movement happening. Plus, it's the end of the year, so people have their budgets finalizing. It's a yeah. It's been hectic, but it's a good kind of hectic. It's definitely yeah. uh, you see the space increasing. You know, I'm excited to see acquisitions in, on both sides. Right? Like there are endpoint companies acquiring other companies, and in mm -hmm. the opposite as well. I, I that's encouraging to me. I get 
concerned when I see, you know, larger companies just swallowing up, you know, smaller companies, especially in particular uh, spaces, which I mean, it's bound to happen. Right. But um, yeah. Also, go ahead, John. I, I I, I just also think in this space, right, it seems like every week there's three or four new endpoint security products that come out. And I can only imagine if you're like a VC funding company at this point, if uh, like a group of people come in and they're like, uh, so what's your pitch? Okay, here we go. Endpoint security. And I could just see VC funders like, get the hell out right now. There's, there's it, four yeah, million. It's kind of like on Shark Tank when they come up <laughs> and they go, hey, like, we're, we're pitching a new app. And all the investors are like, yeah, all right, next. Oh, God. <laughs> like, we already and, got too many apps. <laughs> and I feel like I can joke with Endgame at this point because they're one of the ones that, are gonna, that is going to survive yes. at this point, which is great. Yes. But is, it seems like every week there's four new companies that are like, no, we do endpoint security completely different than everybody else. And you're like, oh, God. No, they don't. Right. Yeah. The uh, the common phrase around here is it's uh, there. There's a lot of features masquerading as products, and yeah. people have great ideas, and they go, "Well, I got to get on the end, you know get on the endpoint. It's the easiest way to do that." So uh, you see them sprawling up. It's also, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but the with network being mostly encrypted now, uh, people need to get to the endpoint for visibility. So you either mm -hmm. have uh, people that are working with endpoint partners, or they say, oh, "I'm going to do it myself." So yeah, it's it's a it's a burgeoning space, or, or I should say, it's been burgeoning, but it's. It's crowded, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I think, you know, Miter is really trying to help us in this uh, situation. <laughs> it's a, kind of a good segue, right? They came out with the Miter attack framework, and now they're doing evaluation. So, Mike, explain for us what this whole evaluation, you know, excuse me, kind of thing was. Yeah, and, and it's, a great, it's a great point. I mean, I, uh, I joke a lot that, you know, as soon as you put cybersecurity in LinkedIn, you get flooded with every vendor trying to sell you everything. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, especially on the endpoint, right? You get, you get a lot of snake oil and a lot of, uh, a lot of people reaching out trying to promise you the world. And there hasn't been a ton of third-party assessments that have been out there that really uh, prove claims beyond the, the initial, hey, I stopped malware, right? There's a lot of third-party labs that do a, a good job at evaluating, you know, uh, file-based execution and things like that. But, you know, there's the whole... Part that scares everybody, right? The hands-on keyboard or the post um, the post compromise, the persistence, the, whatever it might be, that has been frightening the world that a lot of uh, people put in their sales pitch, right? Right at the front, you can't stop this thing. And no one's done a great job uh, to of assessing that in a really qualitative sense uh, uh, that that helps you understand the coverage and the visibility that these companies have. And so MITRE took a pass. I mean, MITRE being a federally funded nonprofit company, great. Mm -hmm. They don't have any vendor influence. And they uh, they took what they, the attack matrix they had uh, focused this this round on a specific APT and mm -hmm. basically you know thought or went through all the different types of uh, techniques that APT uses and said let's see how different products do and they took seven products and they and they just hammered on them for a couple of days and put out really detailed robust information about the truth of what the product does and with no uh, no pitch around it which I think is really well, useful for the business. And I also think the details were key, um, uh, you know, like instead of the NSS labs where it's like we used commonly generated malware and very little detail as far as what they did, how they evaluated it. And then they also have like like lines in there uh, that some vendors were invited to come and make configuration changes to their tool. And you're like, well, what, what were those changes? Mm -hmm. So I love the detail in this report. It's, it's basically where the reporting needs to be. Yeah, with screenshots too, which is phenomenal, right? Actually showing you where, because you know, a lot of times you can say you have it, but actually seeing what the analyst would have to look at, because at the end of the day, you have to use the product, right? So it can't just be for uh, the one expert that built it knows how to do it. So providing a screenshot that says, here's exactly where we saw that thing, uh, I think has been really crucial. I mean, kudos to the team for the, at MITRE for putting together such a robust methodology. And like you said, publicizing the exact details of everything they use to go through the test. Yeah, I think, you know, having worked for vendors in the past, I was largely disappointed across the board about evaluations in general, whether that was evaluations from a customer, an independent, you know, third party or not independent third party. I, just across the board, there was always a few things that kind of bugged me as to how people were evaluating the product. But it, it sounds like you're pretty happy, you know, Mike, in, in your position, right? You probably spent a lot of time handing off to MITRE, right? I'm familiar with that process, right? There's question there's all kinds of things to fill out and do they got to hand them the product and documentation and things like that sounds like you're pretty happy with it yeah i mean we've been closely tied to miter for for years now mm -hmm. uh we integrated them in our product uh oh i think about 18 months ago where you could link out to miter techniques and actually explain what the alerts were uh, we've been contributing back to miter with uh things like com hijacking i think some other ideas that our research teams discovered 
So we've been really close with MITRE and thought it was, you know, actually all last year I went to uh, NHISEC, now HISEC and FSISEC and just talked about how to increase your security program and actually utilize MITRE as a framework for that, uh, getting past the more uh, more high level sort of Lockheed Martin framework. And uh, and then they decided to do a test. So it was, it was kind of perfect, uh, perfect timing that we had already put a lot of effort into integrating and, and sort of uh, working with MITRE. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I think that the data speaks for itself. Uh, the challenges, because they, the one thing MITRE didn't do, which I think is the right call, is they didn't score it, right? They didn't say that, you know, yeah. Vendor X did this and Vendor Y did that, which led to some marketing spins from some companies that I think uh, dilute the, the truth of, the, of what's going on out there. But mm -hmm. the good news is the data is out there. So for the practitioners, they can look into it. There's actually some great, I think oh, I already saw an open source project on, on uh, Git where the, somebody's, you know, put together their own analysis of the data. Uh, so, you know, it's out there. I would I encourage people to dig into it and see, you know, not just how the product is coverage, but also look at the screenshots and see, you know, can I use this thing in my environment? Yeah, it's it's interesting. A lot of things that generate a score, um, it, people are just like, well, I'm just going to take the thing that, that has the highest score. And if you look at the way you do that in your life, right? Like, actually, I was just talking to my wife about, you know, how do I find, you know, an, an eye doctor, right? You know, it's with the, the glasses on, right? And it's like, well... I'm just going to like go read reviews and, and see who's in network. And she's like, she works in the medical field. She's like, yeah, no, you have to like talk to someone, get a referral. And I, I feel like it's the same thing when we talk about scoring a product at that could be skewed in so many different ways. And then that doesn't tell you if it's the right product for you. And I think that similar things with yeah. CVSS scoring right on the vulnerability side, I, it, it's got to be tailored to you. And so I, I actually like the fact that they didn't, use a score because it could land people with the wrong product. Yeah, they actually did a great job explaining that in a blog post. And I think uh, our uh, VP of research, Mark Dufresne, who's been on the show, also put a really nice blog post together about this that said exactly that, right? Each business has a different uh, you know, risk. Each business uh, has a different uh, set of problems they're focused on. So what Mutter did is said, here's the data, here's mm -hmm. the coverage. Uh, they have a, a great page called, uh, for groups where you can focus on threat groups. And basically, you know, if you're in financial, Look at the threat groups that target financials and look at the techniques they use and do those techniques. Uh, you know, where are they in the in the matrix and do you have coverage of those techniques? Because you could be focusing I, I, on the percentage that might have nothing to do with who targets your organization. Right. Yeah. It, it, so it's you're exactly right. You need to tailor the results or tailor the answers to your business. I, I've got to throw my like quote in for this. It's it, I think that that's great for trying to get buy in for management, right? If you're saying, okay, here's what's here's who's targeting financials, and this particular product came out on top. But I strongly discourage anybody from saying, okay, we're going to develop our defenses based on the attacks that we have seen in the past that are specifically targeting our organization, because that that may or may not be the techniques that are used against you in the future. Yeah, that's a phenomenal point. I think. Uh... Yeah, I think you're right. And I would say that we maybe the right way to phrase that was, would be that it's a good prioritization, right? Because you can't cover the whole matrix at once. Uh, so at least covering the things that have hit you before is a good first step. And then like, you're exactly right that, you, that you're that you going to have techniques and tactics that hit you that you've never seen before. So you need to grow into those. But I've definitely seen yeah. sort of the analysis paralysis in some CISOs and, and their teams where they look at the matrix and go, how do I cover this whole thing? Uh, and trying to help them piecemeal it or focus on the areas in which uh, make the most sense for them to start with are really useful. Yeah, it's interesting. It sounds like a, a combination of where you like understanding where you're most deficient and then also understanding where the likelihood of attack is and using that as a starting point, not yeah. well, it did upon the end game, right? <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. And, I, you know, I uh, one of the things I also do on the side is I teach at Georgetown for cybersecurity strategy. And I always recommend not just a shill here for you guys, but I always recommend a penetration test sort of as your first day on the job. Uh, for exactly that, right? Knowing you have to know your posture first uh, to know where your gaps are. And then, you know, like you said, then you can prioritize what to do next because you can invest in the best security around, uh, you know, people who leverage in embedded tool sets in the environment like PowerShell or WScript. But you might have four other products that already cover that. So you've just wasted your money. Uh, so, yeah, you, it's great to understand the landscape under, and then also understand your, uh, your environment, where your gaps are, and then you can overlay on top of that. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, well, John and Mike, you, you kind of come at this from different angles. When people talk to you about, I want to do the basics or I want to get the low-hanging fruit, I, I, those terms just don't do it justice. How do you guide your respective customers to focus on what's important and, and build some kind of foundation? But that's also kind of a bad term too, right? Like what, how do you get them to prioritize uh, their defenses essentially? 
Yeah, maybe I'll start off. Um, it's it's a great question and one one that we try to help people. I think the the term we kind of use is sort of enlightened customers that know that the compliance is not security and know that they need to do more, but they're sort of you know at that paralysis level of what is next. And uh, you know the visibility is a key kind of first step, right? Would you based on attacks you've seen before, would you even be able to identify them? If, if the, you got a, a call from a three letter agency that said, so-and-so is in your environment and they're using you know, uh, PowerShell, can you even find that with your current tool set? And if the answer is no, then that's, you know you have some areas you need to well, start moving forward in coverage. And this, this, this will come a little bit different uh, of an angle, but we've been talking about it on the show quite a bit. We have a lot of people that come in and they immediately wanna buy a product to actually get to the point where they think that they're secure. And it can be any product. I don't care what it is. And I think that that's a horrible, horrible first step yeah. uh, to make in an organization. I think, especially with a lot of the tools out there that give you the visibility of modern EDRs, um, you will be drowning in white noise. So what I usually recommend is, number one, make your passwords long. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's basic hygiene, number one. Number two, make sure that your firewalls are turned on on your workstations. So your workstations cannot talk to each other. And there's some other things, but let's start with those two. And the reason why I recommend those two things is whenever you're working with getting a product in and you implement something like an end game in your environment, if you have your firewalls established so your workstations cannot talk to each other, it basically cleans up that signal to noise ratio. So you start getting immediate better value out of that product than you would just saying, okay, our, our, our our entire network is crap. Uh, attackers can move laterally absolutely everywhere. We you know, have systems that are broadcasting or responding to LLM and R and all that crap. And let's clean things up before you bring a product in. And then you're going to get so much more value out of that product um, at, the, at the end state. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Marcus Random, uh, actually, we covered an article earlier this week. Basically, it was preaching that good systems administration went into a lot more detail as to what that is that kind of sounds like what john is talking about right is get your house in order establish good processes um clean things up that you're not using and then you're going to have a much better time i mean their security just in that process in and of itself was kind of marcus's mm -hmm. point right yeah it's exactly right i mean it might be blasphemous for a product lead to say but uh, <laughs> i always try to urge people that it's people process then technology at the far bottom of mm. your of your order of cleanup in your in your security organization, right? You need to get the right people trained up that understand your business and your risk and can solve your problems. Then implement the right processes, as you're mentioning, you know, things like network segmentation and, and proper firewalling. And then you can figure out what technology gaps there are and improve those. And we've definitely seen, uh, you know, people that want to jump to technology because that's it seems like the easy, quick silver bullet, right? Well, and it's cool too. Oh. And yeah. it also helps you uh, in your in your company if the customers can clean up before you actually get the product. The success rate mm -hmm. just goes up exponentially at that point um, if the customers can get those basics and fundamentals out of the way. Um, in the uh, now, I want to talk about the technology part of it, right? What did it might or use in terms of malware? And like a secondary question to that is, if I'm an enterprise defender today. Are there certain types of malware and techniques that I really need to worry about? And how do I keep pace with what the attackers are doing? And how much of a concern is that? Yeah, well, I think Mudder did a great job in basically ignoring the initial access or initial compromise step, uh, just assuming that people are going to get in because mm -hmm. these APTs will, right? So they didn't really test a lot of malware or a lot of exploitation. They tested a lot of the follow-on steps, the you know persisting lateral movement, command and control, uh, and they did so with common, you know, sort of tools and techniques. And I mentioned PowerShell is actually one of the bigger ones that they utilized a lot uh, in the organization or in the test framework. And they they did things that they knew that common sort of legacy antivirus and other products would would ignore, would avoid, because it was the, sort of the real point of the test was to show people that, you know, nobody's perfect at prevention. You know, things are going to get through. So you have to be able to find these things that look a lot more like the typical inside user than they do look like an adversary. Uh, and they did a great job. And again, to to the point earlier that you can actually go to their sites. They, did, they put the whole matrix out and if you click on a cell, it'll tell you exactly how they tested with you know almost the exact command line they used mm -hmm. uh, and then tell you how things were detected. So it was a really useful, uh, useful explanation of attacks that go beyond the traditional, you know, just sort of you know, malware dumps that are out there. Mm. Interesting. John, more questions on the MITRE uh, evaluation? There we go. Uh, one of the questions I have is how in the hell do you keep up? Uh, I, I think that with a lot of the products that are on the space right now, I believe that 
you know, endpoint protection, if an organization is willing to commit, is infinitely better than it was even five years ago, right? But we were just on an assessment uh, with a product, not Endgame, uh, but I'm also not going to mention who the product is, but it's one of the leaders in that specific space as well. And there's stupid things, right? Like stopping PowerShell execution. We renamed PowerShell to p.exe and completely bypassed mm. it. How do you stay ahead of all of these stupid new techniques? Uh, we, we did WNF subscriptions to bypass a lot of products as well. It's got to be like this constant game of whack-a-mole um, to constantly keep up with the new techniques that are coming out. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the really hard part. And I think it's a few different layers of it. Um, the first is, uh, you mentioned earlier in the test that Mutter didn't really focus on, I think for good reasons, was the initial access pieces and just having enough enough initial layers in place to, to stop in a, you know, a, a software exploitation or a, you know, user-based macro attack malware, process injections, things like that that start the initial problem. So having a good suite of non-signature-based ways to prevent against that, whether it's you know the, the buzzwords of data science, machine learning for malware, or you know technique-based looks at how threads are executing to find process injection is a good first step. Uh, but assuming they got through that, uh, and this kind of leads a little bit into what we just recently did was open source the language we call EQL or event query language. And the you know the the key term there is really just having visibility at the events and having it in a way that's tamper resistant. You know, not relying on ETW for Windows uh, because it's typically you know, attacked by adversaries, but be able to enrich and gather data yourself out out of the kernel, and then write very robust analytics across that. So we've invested uh, significantly into a research research and development team that you know works closely with MITRE, works closely with you know others in the industry to think forward. So a good example you just mentioned, you know, we actually uh, showed recently, I think it was APT32, that uh, used an attack that renamed WScript to ying.exe, uh, just like you said, the typical defense evasion move where they will just change these processes. Because a lot of these products will hard code, will look for WScript, look for PowerShell, and that doesn't work. Uh, so the things we do are, for example, actually look at the original file name or the compile name and use that, not what the files renamed to, and actually look for a discrepancy there. So things like alerting that ying is running, but it's actually WScript is a key what are the key defensive evasion techniques that we can use to find that APT, for example? Um, but it's now, sorry, go kind, ahead. kind of with that, I was gonna. I wanted to ask you how much of that do you think is actually based uh, on the problems intrinsic with relying too much on artificial intelligence and weighting metrics? So, a lot of artificial intelligence engines they'll say, okay, if we start seeing evil in a particular executable, once it gets past a certain tipping point, we're going to automatically stop it. Uh, from running. And that's great right up into the point that somebody starts feeding good programs or parts of good programs through um, with malicious components. And then you start basically tricking the algorithm the other direction. So some vendors will say, okay, well, if it's, it's, if it's a Microsoft binary, it's signed by Microsoft and it has the name explorer.exe, do not mess with it ever under any circumstances. So you can start renaming things uh, that you would normally use on a Windows system to that name to try to get around those. And that's all based on do not burn Microsoft Windows core libraries to the mm -hmm. ground ever. So how much of that do you see as like an intrinsic problem with trying to establish that artificial intelligence machine learning and trying to balance that without nuking a system because somebody is training the algorithm with really, really bad data? Yeah, I mean, I think the first key is that you can't AI the problem away. And anybody that promises you that and says you don't need a human anymore is, <laughs> is lying to you, right? You have to have, at a certain level of attack, you have to have a sophisticated person because there's sophisticated people at the other side of this as well. Uh, so it's, you know, it's layers. It's the old defense in depth model, but it's in a vertical way now, right? It's defense in depth on an actual, on a single pr uh, protection product. And it's, you know, like you mentioned, there might be layers in which you have, for example, maybe malware protection that, uh, has whitelisted Microsoft as a signer, but you need things below that that are looking for, like I mentioned earlier, these defensive agent type techniques or looking for the sign of an injection into that Microsoft process. Uh, you know, you need to have numerous different, uh, you know, bites at the apple or whatever analogy you want to say uh, that cover that, that, that aren't all based on, you know, the, the newest buzzword. So you can go from machine learning and AI, but then at the end of the day, there needs to be analytics looking at data that are, you know, modified by humans in a way that can help you find this problem. Uh, all the way into the you know, something we, we didn't talk about too much, but threat hunting, right? Where you can actually just look for anomalies, empowering people to, with one button, you know, find the, you know, what's what's anomalous in the bottom 10% of my organization to help find those problems that slip through all those cracks. Because uh, as you mentioned, you know, bad guys know what we do, right? We actually partner with the university to do adversarial machine learning, We've done some uh, some talks about this at different conferences, but, you know, we know that this is what people are doing now. They're, they're trying to train you know, anti-models uh, against our models. So we, we want to stay ahead of that as much as possible, but also build a secondary and tertiary layer of other ways to find these issues. 
And I, and I think that that last point is absolutely key. If anybody's listening to the show right now, I, I want to make it very clear. A lot of times BHIS, we can bypass these products, but there's a big, there's light years of difference between getting malware, getting a beacon, getting a command and control out of that implant that we've created, but then we're stuck. Uh, with a lot of these products, especially whenever they're mapping over the MITRE attack technique matrix, as soon as we try to do something, that's where we start getting caught. Mm. And you're not ever talking about a product that's going to be 100% in the preventative and the ability to stop all attacks from getting to that system. There's so much more to that story for post-exploitation, lateral movement, dumping credentials out of memory, that even if an attacker can bypass a product in that initial first step, there's more to just that. It's what happens next. And a lot of these products, like let's say they get 80, 85% coverage, that's still infinitely better than where we were with traditional blacklists, mm -hmm. because we may be able to get that implant to run. But as soon as we do anything, we are lit up like a Christmas tree. And I think that that's an important distinction. Anybody that's looking into getting into this product space needs to understand. Um, Mike, you mentioned the uh, EQL or event query language um, is that in it that it's open source. Is this a query language that I query my systems or I query Endgame's database? Like, can you just kind of put it in context uh, before we dig into it a little more? Sure. Yeah, we, we were trying to find a way, uh, an easy way to leverage, you know, deep analytics on top of user or endpoint event data, right? So users, processes, registries, you know, all the kind of changes you can expect on an endpoint. And, there, you know, there's some good products out there, but we wanted to find one that was more agnostic to the types of data, right? Because, of course, we have EQL running on our product. It leverages the data we collect and how we enrich it. Uh, but, you know, what, like we saw with things like Snort and like Yara, the power is in the scale of people, right? The more people that, that are looking and leveraging and, and trying to write ways to find problems using the language, the better the rest of the industry gets because we get that collective kind of learning and understanding. So we, uh, we decided to open source the, the language so that we can get more people using that language to help all of us and especially help our customers with, with uh, more protections. We started off with uh, Sysmon data right now. So we basically leverage, uh, we, we open source this piece of technology that can layer on top of your Sysmon data. And it's a really easy, tech, uh, easy way to write, you know, stateful type analytics across your information that looks a little bit like SQL, that's the name, right? It's mm -hmm. sort of like, look for this, where this is here. And, you can do some really amazing kind of uh, things, I think, very quickly. You know, look for any processes spawned from a, a run key that opened up a network communication to this IP range or created a file or, you know, very complex analytics can be done in a single sentence on top of, you know, sort of agnostic data. So Sysmon's now, we have some great uh, sort of a roadmap of, of other researchers helping us out to do things like expand to audit D and OS query and others. And, and the goal is to really, you know, just further the industry and have a, a, a very easy way for the industry to write uh, and, and sort of share analytics across these events, right? I, I have this problem, here's how I found it, and then we can implement that across the different systems. I gotcha. That's really cool. Um, starting with Sysmon, as we, you know, have run segments on other shows about bypassing Sysmon, it's, you know, you have to take that into consideration, but it sounds like you're adding on other sources that you can query to uh, identify specific events. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in our product, we're utilizing, you know, we, we're in the kernel, we event ourselves, we put yeah. in our own store. Uh, yeah. So, you know, for us, it's much more hard and tamper, I'll call it resistant. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, definitely for customers, who, you know, like you mentioned earlier, uh, we want people to get better at security. It does us all better, especially when, you know, companies have my data too. Uh, and, you know, a good way to do that is to is to leverage existing tool sets. So if a customer doesn't have the the funding or, or the time to implement new technologies, but they have Sysmon running in some places, they can start to get a little bit better. And as they get more comfortable with doing more EDR or more, uh, you know, sort of hypothesis hunting in their environments, then maybe they start looking at technology next and can find a product that can help them leverage that. And so it's, a, you know, hopefully it's a win-win for us and for the industry as a way to, you know, make a more and easier to use sort of standardized way to look at these events. In Mike, how does this tie, uh, explain what Atomic Blue and Atomic Red Team is and how it uh, now kind of ties into the EQL language? Yeah, that, that was really cool. And I, I want to lean back earlier on a point said that, you know, I agree. I think a key fallacy in testing is that people are too commonly test, and I've seen it a lot of times, they test symptoms, not mm. attacks. Mm -hmm. You know, so they'll say, oh, well, this, you know, you missed this specific way I executed this thing. Uh, but you really want to understand if the overall attack is successful because no product is going to get every single thing, right? But can you stop the whole problem from happening? So a great way to do a proof of concept, if you can, if you have the ability to afford it, is to also leverage uh, a pen test company to do it sort of hand in hand, right? To say, let's have actual red teamers go after the product with an actual thing on the blue side. Uh, and I think that's a phenomenal way to really truly 
bear out how good a product is in an organization. And so Red Canary uh, has a, an, an awesome way to uh, sort of do some red team testing across the MITRE framework, with it, which they call Atomic Red. And we partnered with them when we, when we launched Equal to provide uh, a way to help defenders find those things. So if you have, uh, right now, if you have Sysmon and in the future, other types of data types, you can, uh, we've released, I think about 30 or 40% so far, and we're going to keep increasing, hopefully not just us, but the rest of the world will keep increasing, mm -hmm. uh, something we call Atomic Blue, which is the ways to find the Atomic Red attacks that are in the organization. So you can do a, an attack and a detection uh, together in a, in a pen test, or a, so I guess purple teaming is the term now, to help make your company better, but also hopefully to help evaluate vendors better as well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And, and the ultimate thing shouldn't be, ha, we caught you, or ha, you did not catch us, uh, whatever the value that actually brings. It, like you said, it should be across the board. So when you're testing it, it should be scientific. Look for gaps and then try to fix those gaps or fill those gaps whenever you do identify them. And I think that that's a fundamental shift in the way people are looking at testing uh, moving forward, which I think is a great step forward. Yeah, I think a lot of these red teaming companies like yourselves have done a great job at teaching people that failing is a, does not make you a failure, right? In security, you're going to miss things. And I think as long as you learn from them and address them and put them onto a, a roadmap to get better, to increase visibility, whether it's through, you know, again, you know, processes or people or technology, that's the key point. And I think people are less and less afraid to bring a, a, a pen test team in now and find gaps than they have been due to the teams really helping to push that messaging forward. Um, we want to do story time now, I think. <laughs> That's what I dubbed it. I dubbed it story time, John. Okay. Is that my, is that, that my new, that's my your new cue question? Now. Yeah, that's your cue now. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So here's the question. Uh, we oftentimes on the Security Weekly shows uh, have the question, what problem are you trying to solve? And that's, that's good. However, in this show, we have one that's a little bit different. What problems have you solved? And we understand that you can't ever talk about specific customers. But is there a customer story that you can say, you can say customer X, where you went in and you solved a specific problem or you found some malware that nobody else had detected? Something that when you're looking back on your career 15 years from now, that you're going to look on back with pride of what you've done at Endgame. Yeah, um, I think you know, what I'm most proud of, and I think it's we have to do it in this industry right now, is making a product that can be used by people. Uh, you know, you... Uh, how many different articles are out about the cybersecurity gap and you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the deficit. And you, any company we talk to, and I'm sure you talk to them as well, the first thing they say is, I don't know about people to solve this issue. Uh, you can find people that have, you know, they wear the, the InfoSec hat and then they take their hat off and then they also wear the IT admin hat and they have other, you know, many different jobs. So they can't be full-time in a product. So building a technology that can help them get better in their security posture, but also be usable has been really crucial. So for us, you know, that's been, I think, a key thing that I'm proud of. And I can give you a, a couple quick examples. Uh, in one case, uh, we went to a university, uh, a very large university with many different agencies underneath. And they had a great program where they had a SOC, a very small SOC, but they had uh, in that SOC uh, student workers as well, where they brought students in that were able to you know, leverage the products and, and get, you know, I think it's an awesome program. They got smarter at cybersecurity, got to put it on the resume, but also we're helping you know, staff this team. And, you know, one of those students uh, that was using the Endgame product became, I think, the cybersecurity student of the year in, in one of those magazines and, uh, you know, just provided a lot of great abilities. They actually uh, replaced their sort of legacy AV. And uh, the statistic they gave us was their, their mean time to, to respond to a problem went down from, uh, you know, many days to, you know, minutes or, or because they were able to actually enact these, these changes. You know, they had basically what they had was legacy AV and then they had to contact that agency's IT admin to do changes, right? So... I found a problem possibly ring up somebody and say, hey, uh, are you able to find this laptop? You know, does this, can you check and see if it has this thing? Can you re-image it maybe or delete this thing? They were able to do all that themselves from the platform in sort of a, we have a thing we call in-game resolver, which is basically the timeline view, which you can see in the MITRE uh, screenshots they have. Where in that, the analysts can see it's a problem, they can click, they can kill a thing, delete a thing, you know, remove a thing, whatever they need to do to respond or mediate to that. And it's, you know, it's usable by students, right? Which I think is the, the crucial part because not everybody's going to be a security expert. Um, you know, the, the equal that we just released or EQL we just released has a layer on top of it that we call Artemis, which is natural language. And what we show people is that they can have students that can say, hey, search for google.com and it's going to go find if Google was ever accessed. Or they can write an equal query that says, you know, show me if anybody went to Google, then download a file, then did this and that. So the power is to go from sort of very easy and usable into, you know, sort of the power mode for people like yourselves and, and other security experts. And I think walking that line, not building an expert system just for experts has been really, I think, the key part of what we've been focusing on as a company. 
Um, That's a great story. Well, yeah, I relate to that story, Mike, because I worked for a university and was doing incident response where I either like a lot of times there wasn't someone on the other end of the phone. Right. Or they right. weren't there or they're like, I don't know where the system is. And they're like, can you just come out? And it was a hundred and forty four acre campus. Parking Ooh. was was not great in this area either. Um, so I had to get there. And then, I mean, it was a, a large university. So you can imagine the different departments, right, that are underneath. I, I can remember sometimes having to put on, like, like surgical scrubs and, like, booties and stuff to go into the room where the computer was where I had to verify whether or not, you know, it was compromised. Uh, and, and, again, that, that could take days, right? Uh, right. In the meantime, it's compromising all this other stuff in the, in the university, and they're like, I can't pull the plug. And, you know, there's a lot of issues with that. So uh, I think that's a great story that I personally relate to. Yeah, I, mean, I appreciate that. And that's, you know, definitely we hear the pain from people. And you do this all the time too, right? You talk to people and it's usually uh, the the underwaterness of how these people operate, unfortunately, in security and how much they have to do with so little. Mm. And, uh, you know, we see these news articles about people getting breached and we say, how could they? But I think we know that, you know, of course, because they're underwater, they're overloaded. And we try to help with that. We try to help not, you know, fit into the workflow, not increase the alert volume, hopefully decrease it by like closing down things like mean time to detect and mean time to remediate and helping give more people access. We would, we actually, uh, helped, uh, uh, one lady, you know, sort of change her career path. She was a registered nurse for many, many years and was really interested in cybersecurity and one of our healthcare companies we're in, uh, she said, Hey, can I try it out? And she actually moved into the, into the security team and is doing, you know, SOC analysis and remediation now. But just being able to be usable and, and help people that want to, that have a passion for cybersecurity mm. to do it, you know, be a business expert, not a, not a product expert, I think is really crucial. No, that's awesome. Very cool. Well, Mike, thank you very much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. With that, we'll take a short break and come back with the Enterprise Security News. Stay tuned. 